Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. You were born to make manifest the glory that is within us. And it is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. And that was said by Marianne Williamson. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. It truly is important that people discover their own power and discover their own light and stand in that, folks. It's very important that people lose their fear of their own power. But most people do have a fear of ever discovering and standing in and using the power that they all inherently have. They have a fear of letting their light shine. And the reason people are in this state of personal fear about themselves is because of certain aspects of society, certain pathological aspects of society. Essentially, people's minds are infected by certain things that can really only be viewed as pathogens, psychological pathogens. And these things are mainly the economic system, which is an economic pathogen, the social system, the hierarchical social system, which also infects people's minds like a pathogen, and of course the very obvious religious pathogen that infects people's minds. And these three mechanisms or pathogens very much affect people's ability to be themselves, to be all that they can be, and very much paint people into a corner and prevent them from ever wanting to stand in their own power or let their light shine. The social pathogen is actually a very, very effective mechanism because the social pathogen helps to control people in as much as they tend to police themselves. They police their own thoughts and police their own actions because they are very, very concerned about peer group pressure. And these things, of course, are social constructs that have no real bearing on who we are. Because peer group pressure is essentially a set of fictional social parameters by which we judge ourselves and judge those around us. And that's really all peer group pressure is, folks. It's a construct. But the reason I refer to these three things as pathogens that infect human minds and infect human consciousness is because all three of these mechanisms lead people away from who they are. And they do so by providing a false reality, a false sense of reality to people. The economic pathogen is a very interesting one as well because people are kept in a constant state of scarcity. They're taught that they need to collect paper in order to have everything that the world provides for them in abundance. And Because they are never really able to get enough of this paper, they tend to want to hoard it when they get it. And when they do start getting it, and when they start accumulating a little bit, they always want more. No matter how much you've got, you want more. Because as you're collecting it, you're seeing the price of things going up, and you're realizing that, well, I thought I needed this much for my security, but I think now I'm going to need this much for my security. But inside you, you still know that it won't be enough because the system is designed to keep you in scarcity and milk all your wealth from you anyway. So you just need to collect more and more of this stuff. And you realize that what money is, is a talisman for control and that it affects people's minds like a pathogen. It's like economic mind control. That's just the way it works. It really does affect people's minds. And they will place economic gain and financial acquisition over almost anything else in as far as priorities go. 
you'll find that people become very competitive with each other and people will extract as much wealth as they can from each other to the point where they create homeless people and they dispossess those around them simply to obtain more digits in their account. And you have friends that do this. You'll have friends that treat each other like commodities, and yet they're supposed to be friends, but all they will really do is profit from one another. Things such as multi-level marketing and home businesses, Amway, all this sort of stuff are great examples of this, folks. You know, you have a group of friends, and hey, we can teach you how to turn your group of friends into commodities that you can profit from. And so that way they break down the friendship and they turn everybody into a business opportunity. This is the way the economic pathogen affects the mind. And you'll have people who may go into a business venture together and things will all be worked out. But once money starts being made, then there somehow doesn't seem to be enough to go around for many of the people that were involved. And the more money that's made, then it would appear the less there is to go around. That's the thing, folks. Once you start accumulating this stuff, it literally affects your mind and makes you want more. That's just the way money works. And this is done because society is kept in a constant state of scarcity. And when you combine the effectiveness of the economic pathogen with the social pathogen, then you get a very interesting dichotomy. Because if you look at the social pathogen, the social pathogen teaches us that we have to be at a certain level on the social scale, a certain rung on the social ladder. And we obtain these rungs and we're able to move up the ladder by means of acquisition. Acquisition, of course, requires you to exploit other people for economic gain or to perhaps create a a business, a a successful business. And what is a successful business, folks? Well, a successful business can be many things, but very often what you're really doing is you're creating some item and you're convincing people that they want this thing when really they don't. It's nothing that they actually need because there's nothing about this society that we do actually need. I mean, not as far as what we make and use on a daily basis, folks. I mean, why do we need plastic furniture? Why do we need all of the prefab stuff that we've got? Why do we need all these building materials and all the things that we make? It's only because we make things to break. We make everything to be temporary because we do it to support capitalism and to support the economic model. And that's what it's all about. I mean, sure, there are some things that we, we need as a society. I mean, that, that goes without question. If we're going to have a society, there are some certain things that we need. I mean, things like electricity, things like the Internet. But, I mean, even with things like electricity and the Internet, I mean, sure, these sorts of things are very handy, but we don't actually need them for survival. But even though, okay, you might say, well, yes, we do. Well, okay, if we do, that's fine, but we could do them and provide all of these things for humanity in a way that didn't put people in scarcity. I mean, if we were all working together as one species and working for a way to improve the human condition, we would provide all of the services that we've got for free because this is what humanity needs to have a society like this. We need infrastructure. We need roads. We need electricity. We need all of this stuff. So we should create systems that are functional and long-lasting and that don't break down all the time in order to support an economic model. And we'd find that things would be a lot better, would really free people up and give people a lot more time to be able to pursue more philosophical matters. And this is really what we need to do. We need to get our right brain a little bit more active. The social pathogen also focuses very heavily on ego because once people start accumulating more physical wealth, they start to view those below them with less physical wealth than themselves with a little bit more disdain than they did before. Very often, this is the way people become. And they become almost fearful of people who are below the poverty line. The homeless people, oh no, we don't want homeless people on the corner. We must make them go away because they could be dangerous. They seem to forget that these people are just people like them that have been discarded by the system. And so this is how you're able to discard the people, really, you see, because you create this fear within people. They have fear of social class. You create the social ladder, and people have fear of falling off the ladder, and they have fear of the classes below themselves. 
And so these people are able to be discarded. And then as the wealth is further and further stolen from people through the economic pathogen and the social pathogen, then people are more easily discarded because the people above them on the next rung will always let the rung below them fall into the wasteland because they believe that if they mollycoddle to the people above them further up on the rung, then those people will hang on to them. They'll give them a life raft when time comes for them to fall off. But yet they didn't do that to the people below them. And so why would they really expect it from the people above them? And it keeps going up the ladder, folks, till you get to the very top. And you find that that's who controlled all the mechanism that was used to dispossess the people beneath them. And that's the way it works. Game, set and match, checkmate. And the ruling class wins. The psychopaths win. And as I mentioned last week, folks, this is accomplished very, very much through an almost global Stockholm Syndrome that the planet is going through. Because, as I said, people will always mollycoddle to those above them. And you might think that those above you will help you, but they won't because inside they know they're not really in control and they know that they may be dispossessed just as easily as you are. But they firmly believe that if they mollycoddle to the slave trader above them, the slave master above them, then that slave master will help them. But of course they won't because they're a slave master. They won't help them because they too are infected by the economic and social pathogens that have caused all of this whole situation to be created. And so that's the way the social and economic pathogen work together. So you see, they're very, very complementary of each other. And of course, all of this is much more easy to perpetuate and much more easy to convince the people that it's real by the mechanism of the religious pathogen, because the religious pathogen will always teach people to expect things to get worse and to love their enemies and to not really worry about it because once you're all dispossessed and everything seems like it's lost, you will have a supernatural saviour appear from the heavens and perform superhuman actions to miraculously save everybody. And all the evil tyrants will be taken away to hell and suddenly we will all ascend to heaven. So, of course, the religious pathogen is what creates and perpetuates the continual degradation that mankind is subject to. And it does so in a manner that most people can accept. And not only do they accept it, but what is most interesting to me is that in many ways they welcome this suffering because that's also what the religious pathogen instills into people's minds is the the concept that suffering is good, that suffering brings redemption, the meek shall inherit the earth, love those who oppress you, do not fight against your enemies, allow yourself to suffer because suffering is noble and suffering brings about redemption. Actually, for anybody who is interested in a very good breakdown of what the Christian religion actually is and what the whole salvationist redeemer concept is really all about, I would recommend reading a book by John Lamb Lash called Not in His Image. It's actually a very, very good critique of Christianity taken from a Gnostic perspective. And in that book, he really does lay a few things on the table, the way certain messages have actually been reversed in the Bible and the way the whole doctrine has been laid out. It very much appears to be quite good and quite loving and quite functional on the surface, but a deeper analysis shows that it's actually anything but. It's actually a system of slavery. And this is something that many of us have known for a long time, but I particularly like the way John Lash laid it out in that book. And I do highly recommend that people read it. It's a very, very interesting tale. It also gives you a very good account of the Sophianic myth, the, the Gnostic story of creation, which is a very, very fascinating and very enlightening story. It's a story that just resonates, and you think there's, there's something to this. It's a very, very interesting tale. And I particularly like the story that John Lamb Lash presents in his interpretation of the Sophianic myth. The Sophianic myth can be found in a collection of writings called the Nag Hammadi Writings, which were a, a 
cache of Gnostic texts that were found in Nakamani, Egypt. The English translation, which is available of the Nakamani writings, was unfortunately sort of translated with a, a slightly Christian slant, and the beauty of John Lamb Lash's translation or his interpretation of it is that John Lash is a comparative mythologist and understands a little bit more about Gnostic teachings than most Christians would because Christians tend to put a Christian slant on the way they view things. And I really do feel that John Lash has done an excellent job in his interpretation and presentation of the Sophonic myth. So there you go, folks, a bit of a book recommendation. And I don't often recommend books, but I would highly recommend that book, Not In His Image, by John Lamb Lash. And look, I would warn you that it may be a little confronting to some Christians or perhaps Jews out there, but, um, well, it's good to look at these things and to look at things from all angles. And I feel that people need to broaden their field as much as possible and look at things as widely as possible in order to truly understand what's going on. Very often back when I first did the shows, when I first began doing the shows, I used to recommend that people try to step back as if they're sort of standing in space and looking down at the planet as if it's a chessboard and you kind of look and see how all the things connect together. But really you're not just looking at physical things, you're also looking at at psychic things and, and mental things, mind control. When you look at the earth, instead of looking at it as different coloured countries, look at it as different coloured belief systems and see how all these belief systems mesh and what they really create because what they create is division. But also understand how a system of mental slavery works because we have a race of people that are quite literally in a state of mental slavery. They're living in a fictional paper-based matrix and they're actually worshipping and adoring those who oppress them and those who run the prison. It's really, really subtle and it's very bizarre. You know, love thy servitude. We hear about this sort of stuff all the time and we hear people talk about this, about how they're going to create a world where people will love their servitude and they tend to make you think that this isn't already happening. But it is. It's been going on for a very long time. Look how far back in history people were adoring the king and the rich people. You know, the Rothschilds walk in and everyone goes, oh dear, it's Evelyn Rothschild. And they all rush to give him things and give him a free meal. I mean, you get a rich person who goes to a restaurant and goes, oh no, it's for you. I'll, I'll give it to you for free. Because again, it's this pathogen. Oh, he's rich. If I suck up to this guy, when I fall, he will look on me with favor but he won't because he's a psychopath but we still have this adoration towards those who oppress us it's very very bizarre and we're taught that these systems of slavery that are going to exist where we will love our servitude we're told that these things are where we're heading but folks really it's where we already are we're living in a society and within a situation in the west where we are affected by mental pathogens that keep us locked into a system of servitude that we feel comfortable and secure in. We don't really want things to change. We can complain about things a lot. I mean, a lot of the people out there in the truth community who complain about the system and they want to bring the system down, and yet they depend on the system. They go and use the supermarkets. They do all the stuff that everybody does. They just complain about it. And if the system was to really be brought down and the battle was really to be won, these people would not know what to do with themselves. So what is the real answer? Well, the real answer is to see what the mechanism is, I believe. That's the real answer. You see how the mechanism works. Look at the right information and gather the right information and keep an open mind. Don't get locked into a belief system. Just keep an open mind and look at everybody's research. Look at all the research that's out there and then take a step back and look at the world that exists around you. Look at what you are swimming in and you begin to see what's really going on here. Have a look at native cultures. If you can, go to South America or go go somewhere where there is a native culture and look at how these people live. Look at how happy and content and wonderful these people are. Go spend some time with the Shipibo people. In the, in the Amazon jungle. Amazing people that are very, very happy and very contented and that have this real connection to the earth. 
They don't need civilization. Now, we've lost a lot of that. We've lost this real connection that we had to the earth. And we need to get that connection back. Now, something that I've mentioned for years, I've been talking about it, is that everything progresses. If you look at nature, everything progresses through Fibonacci sequence. When plant leaves appear, it's all mathematically perfect. It's all Fibonacci sequence, the whole lot. And the way the Fibonacci sequence works is that you take the number and you combine it with the previous number and you get the next number. For example, 1 and 2 is 3. From there you would go 3 and 2 is 5. And from there you would go 5 and 3 is 8. And then you would go 8 and 5 is 13. 13 and 8 is 21 and so forth. That's the way Fibonacci sequence works. But essentially what I'm saying here is when you look at it from a more holistic and right brain perspective, what you see it is that you are combining the present, the number you are on, with the past, the previous number, in order to create the future, the next number. And that's what we have to do as a consciousness as well. You see, we've created some technology that can be quite useful to us. Electricity, the internet, lots of stuff that we've got now is quite useful that we could use. And We don't want to bring the system down and lose what we've created, but we can't lose contact with the old ways as well. What we need to do is combine the knowledge of the past, the knowledge of the shamanistic traditions that still exist, with the knowledge and the technology that we have now in the present. And if we can do that, we can combine the present with the past in a harmonious manner, then we can create a viable future. That's how the future is created. That's how consciousness evolves. And that's how anything that should be deemed as civilization would evolve as well. But we don't have a civilization that's civilized. We have a civilization that's technologically advanced to nature or technologically different to nature. I mean, I don't know what you'd call our civilization, really. It's a hard one to categorize. But it certainly isn't civilized. I mean, if you look at history and how they record the rise of civilization, you'd think, well... They don't really class anyone as being civilized until they developed a culture where they started to bury their dead. And we bury our dead in these plots, these cemeteries that we create. So it's very strange. They say that once we start to collect dead people, then we become civilized. I don't really know how that works. But what I'm saying here, essentially, folks, is that think about it. You know, with the technology that we've got and and the, the knowledge that we've got, this left brain understanding that we've now got, if we can combine that back with our right brain and combine that with the shamanistic traditions, the knowledge of the plants, the knowledge of what reality really is, the future that we could create could be absolutely spectacular. But the problem is that the civilization that we've got now is wiping out all of those ancient cultures, all of that ancient past. And if we don't have that past to root ourselves and ground ourselves in, then we will have a future which is ultimately chaotic and ultimately completely centered in left brain, which will essentially be a locked down robot civilization where everybody is trained to think and act in a predetermined way, a way that is acceptable within the parameters of this civilization. And this civilization will be an imitation of reality. It will have essentially skewed mankind from their true path because the true path of mankind is a path that acts in harmony with the planet that we inhabit and with all life on the planet acts in respect for each other and works to nurture the human creative spirit the creative spirit of mankind because We are capable of so much. Everybody has that spark of creativity and that urge to do something wonderful within them. It's in everybody, but it's been taken away from us by this left-brain civilization. So something's happened to skew us from our path. This is what some people call a schism. David Icke calls it the schism. Well, Whatever it is, there is something that happened that skewed us from that path. And that's why the shaman are coming out now the shaman that are left and and coming out and attempting to do ceremony with as many people as they can around the planet now to introduce them to the knowledge of the plants because they feel it's the only way to give people a crash course in reality to get them back to that connection with with spirit 
and they feel that people need to do this because it's our loss of connection to spirit which has actually skewed us from our path and if we don't get this connection to spirit back again then we're going to take the shaman with us we're going to take everything with us we're going to take the whole world down with us into this machine-like society that we seem to be creating and that is a great concern ladies and gentlemen and that's why it's so important to become aware of these pathogens it's so important to let go of whatever's happened in the past and it's so important to focus on steps we can take to create a viable future because if we stay here bickering with one another and we keep doing things the way we're doing we're just going to allow the machine to be created around us. But we have to rein it in, folks. We have to bring a stop to it, and we have to put things right, put things back on track, and get mankind moving in the correct direction again. And it's a big job, folks. It really is a big job, because we are so far from the path we should be on. And it is a huge job to get us back to where we should be. There have been certain steps that have been taken to bring us to this point and what we need to do i believe is to be aware of those steps and to reverse the sequence to take us back to the point where we are back on our correct evolutionary path and when i say our evolutionary path i'm not talking about darwinian evolution i'm talking more about conscious evolution because the human spirit, the human creative spirit is, is so powerful and so strong. And really, folks, if we could just be aware of what we've really got here, then the sky's the limit. I think we could create the most wonderful existence imaginable. But we have to get ourselves back in tune with this earth that we live upon. Because she's there. She has everything we need for life and she wants to work with us. And it's about time we paid attention. But I think it's break time here, folks. I'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you for spending this time with me today. And I'll speak to you again in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when you really look at what we're facing here and what we're really swimming in at the hands of these psychological pathogens that infect our minds where we're heading for is a civilization that completely stifles all human creativity that's really what it's heading for because they're making sure that people think in a certain way in everything that they do if you think outside the box you are classed as being ADD or autistic in some way there's a category for everything now they've even made all of the aspects of aging into an illness so that they can then feed you medication to combat this illness of aging, which of course is a natural process. But anything that strays outside of acceptable social limits that are imposed, man-made constructs that are superimposed over reality, anybody who steps outside of these acceptable parameters will be classed as having a disorder and will be drugged. And that's the type of civilization that we're heading for if we don't wake up to ourselves and re-establish our connection. Because it will just be a natural progression, folks. I mean, if we allow things to continue the way they are, that will just be a natural progression. It will end up like Brave New World on steroids. I mean, far out doing anything that our lost Huxley could even have imagined. Yet we still have a way back. We still have a way out of this situation. But it's got to come down to a personal thing. It's got to come down to the individual. And honestly, you know, when you look at cities and you look at how divided these cities are and what sort of a state people are kept in, you really see that we are up against a, a huge amount of brain fog in the general community. I mean, most people you talk to about this sort of stuff, they find it very, very difficult to, to even understand because they're unable to think outside of the box of the, the social system. They're unable to free themselves of the hold of the pathogens that have infected their minds because really that's what they are and i've tried on this show to explain this in so many different ways in, in the hope that every time i explain it in a different way perhaps i'll wake up more people and perhaps we'll create some sort of groundswell and that's that's why i, I do it this way that's why i, I try to 
repeat things but in, in a different way every time just to try to help the penny drop. Perhaps I will say something on one of the shows that someone can use and you can think about it, yeah, well, that made sense and you can then use that to help wake up those around you and help inform people of what's really going on here. But what I've really been attempting to do, and the reason I've, I've had so many people on and I've gone on so many shows and wanted to talk about these things with so many people is because I think if we all talk about it enough, eventually we're going to come up with some idea that will actually work, that will actually free us. We're going to find some mechanism that will empower the community and change the direction the ship of state is sailing in. But what I've found is that there is no silver bullet. There is no remedy that we can fill out on a piece of paper or a form and think that that's suddenly going to change things. Whatever we create, it's going to take our participation. And a good example is the OPPT. And folks, I still really don't see what the problem was that people had with the OPPT because the entire slavery system that's in place is a commercial system. It's based in commerce and it's all based in UCC. For you to even get involved in a commercial activity, it's got to come under UCC regulations. So now there's this filing that says that according to the UCC regulation, if you be, if you breathe, if you're alive, you're not liable to that system. But it's up to you, the individual, to enforce that. It's not a silver bullet that someone put in place and suddenly you're free. You are always free. This whole paper-based reality really doesn't mean anything. It's all fiction. But if you're going to base your reality in paper, well, now there's some paper there that says you're free, should you choose to be free. Do you feel free now? You know, it's just a mechanism. It's just a, a tool that people can use to clear their minds a little bit. And that's really what a lot of these movements are. And that's what a lot of the information that I've seen and a lot of the action that people are taking in, in as much as them speaking out and, and doing radio shows and making films and doing the things they do. What people are attempting to do, I think, the, the truth community anyway, the alternative research community, is they're attempting to clear the brain fog to a large extent. I mean, of course, there are a lot of people in the truth community. As I've said, they're turning it into an industry. It's become a revenue stream. And a lot of people are programmed into the fight, but not programmed into the solution. But there are still very, very good researchers within the alternate research community that present very, very valuable information in an attempt to clear the general brain fog that humanity is suffering at the moment. And I think it's great that we do this because as people wake up to the fact that they are living in a paper-based matrix, it's good for them to have valuable and, and empowering information to find. It's good to have that there ready for them to find. Because when people wake up to how the world works, it can be a huge shock for them. And so it's important to present it to people in a way that leaves them feeling empowered by the information. You know, look at Neo when he woke up from the Matrix. He looked at reality and he went, wow, I can't go back, can I? Can I go back? I mean, of course, he, his world was better before he woke up. But once you're awake to what the system is, then it's very difficult to go back to sleep and simply being awake creates a need within you to wake others up and to pull them out of the machine. Because if we don't, then, well, humanity and this planet is heading for a very bad place. And earlier I was talking in the show, I said, all of creation is based in Fibonacci sequence. And you'll see this in plants, you'll see the way things grow, it's always Fibonacci sequence. And what Fibonacci sequence really is, is combining the present with the past to create the future. And that's why I think it's important for us to embrace the knowledge of our ancestors and to re-embrace shamanistic traditions and to combine these traditions with modern society. And folks, I talk about shamanism and I talk about ceremony and I talk about ayahuasca a little bit on the show here. And some people have criticized me for doing so and telling me that I'm promoting drug use and I'm promoting hallucinogenic plants. And what I have to say to that is that ayahuasca is not a hallucinogenic plant. It's not something that you do for pleasure or to have a good night out. It can be a very uncomfortable experience. 
What ayahuasca is, is a medicine. It's a medicine that heals both the body and the mind. And with humanity in its current state of disconnect that it really is in, I think that what ayahuasca can provide to people is a crash course in reality. Because if you have an ayahuasca experience, then you will connect with the energy. It will bring your higher senses online and you will connect with the energy of this planet and you will see reality as you are supposed to see it. Because Western society is biologically, physically, genetically, electromagnetically, emotionally and mentally locked out of reality. We really are. We are experiencing such a small, small portion of what there is to experience about this world. We're kept there through all of the things that I just mentioned, and we're kept there by the geometric structures that exist all around us and the type of cities and buildings and structures that we create. But we're also kept there by our belief of what is and is not possible. But this belief is actually someone else's belief. It's a belief that's been taught to us via a left brain indoctrination system cleverly disguised as an education system. But the system that we've got, folks, it doesn't educate. It indoctrinates. It teaches you what reality is or what you need to believe reality is. It teaches you not to think outside of the box, to always respect authority and trains you to be a good little cog in the big machine. That's what our education system does. And there really is much, much more to reality than what we can currently perceive from within the parameters that are given to us. Truly the hardest part about things, folks, is that there's so many people now that can see a problem, even people who don't want to know usually don't want to know because they know there's a problem. They just don't want to know what the problem is because they know they can't deal with it. And you can't blame people for being that way because of the construct that they've grown up in. But even though many people do see a problem, it's very, very difficult for people to see what the fix is because there is no easy fix. There is no silver bullet. And what I've been saying recently and what I've said on several interviews that I've done recently is that what has brought us here has been a sequential series of events. So what we need to do is we need to find a way of reversing the sequence. But it's got to start with the individual. It's got to start with the empowerment of the individual. People have to know who and what they are, and they have to be prepared to think outside of the box and to make a little bit of polite noise because we can make noise politely. But most of all, what people have to do is they have to relearn respect, because that's what we don't have. I've said this so often lately that you've got to forgive yourself and you've got to forgive those around you. Understand that nobody has ever been given an even playing field in this reality. Nobody. It doesn't matter what anybody has done. We have to move forward and realize that there are far, far bigger issues than what people have done. All of these things are petty. You know, it's not what people have done, it's what we do from this point. And we have far, far bigger issues to deal with. We have the issue of quite literally planetary survival to deal with. Because if we allow this system to continue the way it's going, there will be no surviving on this planet. The human race simply will not survive itself. So we've got to put aside all of these differences and we've got to focus our attention on the problem and what the solution to the problem is. And really the solution is respect. Because it doesn't matter if we have a revolution. If we have a revolution, we'll pull down one set of parents and we'll put up a new set of parents. We've done it in the past and we'll do it again. That's what we do every time. Every revolution is basically people overthrowing and replacing their elected parents. And there's really more to it than that. Because if we put new parents in place, we've still got the system here and we will still end up with what we've got. We may just delay it for a little while, but it will eventually go back down the same direction because of this money system, because of the 
hierarchical social system because of the three major pathogens that infect human consciousness. They will still be in place. And unless we can remove ourselves from the pathological nature of this society and re-establish our connection with the old ways and re-establish our connection with the earth and with ourselves, well, there'll be no way out of the situation. And this can only come about through respect. That's the thing, folks. It can only come about through respect and forgiveness. That's the most important thing. And again, I'm asking you to forgive psychopathic entities who may be in charge of certain countries because they won't allow you to. They will always act in a psychopathic manner. That's what they do. And even if we were to disentangle ourselves from this corporate system that currently enslaves us, these people will still be there attempting to push it onto you and attempting to control your life in some way because that's what psychopaths do. But if we live in a community that respects itself and respects each other, then we will have the strength of community to stand up against any tyrant because that's what community can do. But it has to come from respect. It's got to be based in respect. And it's not a respect that people really need to earn. Everyone deserves respect. They shouldn't have to earn respect. They deserve respect. The only reason they have to earn respect at the moment is because it's very hard to know who to respect within the parameters of this society because this society creates an incredibly uneven playing field whereby people have to always run around trying to exploit each other in order to collect enough paper in order to pay to be alive. So no one's given an even playing field. So that's why it becomes very, very difficult to judge people. And it becomes very difficult to judge yourself. You have to really let things go, realize what we're up against and realize what the solution is. And if we can't see how much we've been manipulated up to this point and understand that people have never been given an even playing field and learn to put it behind us and simply move forward as one united, respectful species on this planet, then we're never going to find a way out of the mess we're in. Because just that simple action, folks, you know, the action of just simple respect for each other that could cause the whole system to crumble virtually overnight if people simply adopted that attitude. But people won't because people are very scared of showing respect for others and of giving their trust to others, and rightly so because there are still many psychopaths that exist within our society and there are people who are programmed into behaving in a sociopathic manner who will take advantage of these situations. A lot of these people will have to be coaxed back into a normal way of thinking through the kindness of the people that are showing them respect. But some people simply won't make it because some people will be psychopaths. This is inevitable. This is something else that the shaman used to do was they used to weed the psychopaths out of society and never allow them to obtain positions of control in society because essentially that's the problem that we face folks i've done whole shows on that how this is quite literally a psychopathic civilization that has its basis in psychopathic parameters but folks there's a remedy and the remedy is to realize that no matter what parameters it has set up this whole social structure is is ultimately a meme it's just an idea it's just a thought of the way things should be, that the people who are in control have managed to superimpose over reality and they've managed to convince the general population that it's actually real through the indoctrination system that they put them all through. Very clever, folks, but very obvious once you can see through the haze. And again, the main haze that people are subject to are the three pathogens which constitute much of this civilization that is the economic pathogen the social pathogen and the religious pathogen were it not for these three things mankind really would be free and as i explained in the first section it is really quite easy to see these things and it's easy to see how they all work in harmony with each other to create the type of situation we currently find ourselves in. And I know it's a big step for people. It's a big hurdle for people to overcome. 
you know, for people to grasp the concept of a world without money is a big hurdle for people to overcome. For people to understand the concept of the social pathogen and how it works to disconnect them and divide them and externalize everything about themselves that they're seeking in their life, the way it works to do this. It's a big hurdle for people to overcome, and most especially the religious pathogen is a huge hurdle for people to overcome because very often people are so infected by society, and it really is like it infects them. It it reduces them to quite literally a shell of what they could be, and they're so overcome by the parameters that they're forced to live within that the only possible way they see out of it is in their hope of redemption from an external source, their hope that a superhuman figure is going to come and suddenly save the world. And look, really, when you look at it, folks, that's what it is. It's the the concept that we will be saved by Superman. That's really what it's about. Only it's done with all sorts of flowers and bells and nice robes and fancy pieces of vellum and nice scrolls and fancy buildings and lots of chanting and smoke and incense, and so it looks like religion. But really, it's the concept that you're going to be saved by Superman, and it's not going to happen, folks. We have the power to do it ourselves. We have the power to be much, much more than what we are. We have the power to be going in a completely different direction than what we currently are. All we have to do is to see what the mechanism of slavery is that is used to control us. And I find it remarkable that people are so willing to complain about the government system and to see all of the corruption around them, and yet they refuse to see that there could possibly be any corruption in the religious systems, the monotheistic religious systems. But really, folks, they are all just as insidious as each other. They're all just as controlling as each other, and they are all designed to lead people away from their personal power and place their faith in redemption coming from an off-world superhuman saviour figure. And if you think about it, folks, this is a very, very disempowering type of doctrine to immerse yourself in. And a lot of religious people I've spoken to have said, well, what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting that when I die, I just die? Oh, no, no, I can't go with that. You know, when you die, it's all over. But when I die, I go to heaven. And that's what they use to justify their belief in this disempowering system is because if they believe it, then when it's all over, they get to go somewhere else. They don't actually die. So it all comes down to this fear of death, really, that these people seem to have. So what is the purpose of these religious systems then. I mean, they instill a fear of death into people, which causes them to live their entire life in fear of the only part of life which is actually inevitable, which is death. And that seems to be the focus of their life. It's a very, very strange way for people to live, I feel. I think there is much, much more to life than living your life in a fear of death or in an expectation of what may happen to you after you die. I think if you do that, you miss out on what the purpose of your life actually is. You miss out on the time you have here, the perspective that you gain, and the legacy that you leave. And you are strayed from your path as a temporary custodian of this wonderful, wonderful planet that we inhabit. And look, I think these type of understandings just come with knowledge, they come with life, they come as one gets older and one accumulates more knowledge and more wisdom over the years because really that's what it's about. I think most people come to these understandings, they start to see these truths and see these realities. And that's the thing, folks, you've got to understand that all of this is a progressive event. There's no one who's got the whole key or the whole story. You know, when you look at all this alternative research in the world, no one's got the magic bullet, no one's got the entire picture yet because the story is ongoing we're involved in the story right now we are part of history we are living history we are creating history as we speak and the path and the history and the emotional journey of all life on this planet and of the planet itself are all indelibly intertwined and it's an ongoing thing and we're learning as we go 
It's just that a lot of people don't seem to learn. They get stuck in the past. They can't move forward from where they are. And that's why, as I said last week, it doesn't matter if you've made mistakes, folks. It's how you learn. It doesn't matter about who you were. It matters about who you are. It doesn't matter about what you did. It matters about what you do. And that's why every single person out there listening to this radio show today is capable of great things, is capable of helping shift the direction the world is going. Just by being aware that we are living within a psychopathic system, a system that has certain mechanisms that have been put in place that affect the minds of people within this system, virtually like a pathogen, and causes people to behave in pre-programmed ways. Just having that awareness can be a major step in changing reality, a major step in helping the world come into focus a little bit more. And we all have this innate ability to do this. We all have this ability to step back from our lives and step back and actually look at the world and see how it's being played. And we have the ability to look within ourselves and find the truth of ourselves because I believe it's there in everybody. I just think that people avoid it. They avoid it because of the pathogens that infect their mind, the psychic pathogens that have been put in place by this system. And this system truly is a result of the predator mind, folks. I urge people to look at the work of People like Carlos Castaneda, read the the teachings of Don Juan, read the the whole Castaneda series if you can. It's a very, very valuable insight into uh, Native American traditions and the spirit traditions of these people and their understanding of reality. I remember I started reading the Carlos Castaneda books when I was at high school and it was certainly life-changing then, although it didn't sort of help me get along with high school very well. But I think that's a good thing. I never really got sucked into the system. And when I look at it, I probably owe a great deal of thanks to people such as Carlos Castaneda for granting me that insight at such an early age. Have a look at the Gnostic texts. Read the work of John Lamb Lash. Have a listen to some of his interviews. These people have a great understanding of how the predator mind works. And it's important that all people become aware of the predator mind and Be aware of their own mind. Ask themselves if some of the thoughts they're having are actually their own thoughts. Ask themselves whether what they are doing in the world is actually beneficial to their lives and to the world. But don't look at it from an economic or social perspective. Look at it from a perspective of who you really are and what you are here for. Because the people of this planet are quite literally locked into a matrix It's not real. The world that they live in is simply a fiction. And we need to pause and take stock and rein in the ship of state and change the direction we're sailing. We need to sail back to what we could and should be. And look, I could go on and on about this, folks, as I'm sure you know from my radio shows, but unfortunately we have reached that time again and it is the end of the show. So I'm going to have to leave it there. And look, I have received a lot of people asking me to do a show about forgiveness, so I'm so I'll I'll try to get that done for you. I'm now 13 days into my candida diet as well, folks, so that's been very interesting, having a few releases and a few die-offs happen, so I'll keep you posted on how that goes. Thank you to anybody who's ever helped with the website. Thank you for all the emails that you send me. Thank you for the time that you give me, and thank you for listening to the shows each week. I look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take very good care until then. In La Keshe, my friends, in La Keshe.